This is Twist. This Week in Science, episode number 646, recorded on Wednesday, November 22nd, 2017. Twist giving time! Hey everyone, I am Dr. Kiki, and tonight we are going to fill your heads with a kill switch, sinister snails, and poo. But first, Twist is supported by listeners like you. We thank you for your support. We really couldn't do it without you. Disclaimer, disclaimer, disclaimer. The thankful season is once again upon us. And while the president has plenty of turkeys he would like to pardon, we should pause here a moment to consider giving thanks to a creature that has done more than just fill our bellies in a feast. Creature that has nourished our minds and propelled us into a more healthy and prosperous future. The heroes behind many of our Nobel Prize winning humans living lives dedicated to science. And whilst our whiskered cousins may not claim credit for their results, the modern era of science, medicine, psychology would not have been possible without their bold and bountiful contributions, their model metabolisms, their stoic steadfast equivalents of our emotional equilibrium. So to the lab rat and research mouse alike, we offer you our heartfelt thanks this season here on This Week in Science, coming up next. I want to know what's happening, what's happening, what's happening this week in science. What's happening, what's happening, what's happening this week in science. Good science to you, Kim Blair. And a good science to you too, Justin Blair and everyone out there. Welcome to our twist giving episode of this week in science. It is twist giving time again, where we give you lots of science. Oh wait, we do that every week. But yeah, it is twist giving. It's a time for gratitude for science and all the stories we can fill this show with. And I have stories about. Bacterial kill switches, interstellar interlopers, and troubled turkeys. Hmm. What do you have for us, Justin? I've got things that make you go poo. Going viral with bacteriophage transcytosis. And one more reason to wash your hands or less brain samples required. Is that an either or story it's, it's, or it's, the it's same story? Two potential, two potential titles for the same oh. story. Whoa. Okay. Yeah. I want to see where that one goes. Yeah. For show. Sure. <laughs> Blair, what's in the animal corner? I brought some animal courtship, some invertebrate sex, and Woo-hoo. some animal bones. That's tomorrow. After everybody eats, you, there's bones that are left over. Yeah, um, and that's for so making a little bit ahead of the game. More about yeah. bones being bought as presents, which is more what Friday is about. So we'll talk about that. All right. We'll get into it in the Animal Corner and the entire show ahead. But now it's time for me to remind you that you can subscribe to This Week in Science on iTunes, the Apple Podcast places, the Google podcast places, Stitcher, Spreaker, tune in, basically just about everywhere podcasts are. So are we. So look for us there. You can search for This Week in Science and you should find us. You can also find us by doing the same exact thing, looking for This Week in Science on YouTube and Facebook. And you can always visit twist.org, especially if you are interested in taking a look at our 2018 Blair's Animal Corner Twist Calendars which are available now. But right now, it's time for science. Let's go science. Are you are you guys ready? You guys ready? Let's yeah. go uh-huh. science. Let's go. There we go. Yeah. Here we go science. Here we go. We're cheerleading a little bit because we're cheering on the ad- adventures of an interstellar interloper. An object that astronomers found as it just kind of 
passes, it's passing through our solar system and it's not going in the plane of our solar system. It's coming in at a really odd angle, which made everybody go, huh, what about that? That's coming from someplace else. Hmm. Yeah. And then researchers making observations, uh, making observations using the European Space Observatory's very large telescope in Chile, using the FORS instrument on this telescope. Researchers uh, led by Karen Meech at the Institute of Astronomy in Hawaii used four different filters and these images from this FORS instrument on the ESO telescope and combine them with images from other telescopes to take a look at this object that was noticed passing through. And they've pretty much determined that it it varies in its brightness. Karen says, I can't pronounce this name, it's Hawaiian, Umuamua, Umuamua, Umuamua is what it's called. It's a... uh, a Hawaiian name, but it, this object varies in brightness by a factor of 10 as it spins on its axis every 7.3 hours. And we've never seen anything in our solar system vary in such a manner. And the fact that it's varying in the way that it does uh, lets researchers know that it has a really large ratio between its length and its width. So it's long and kind of shaped like a space cigar Mm. or or maybe like, I don't know, a spaceship. Hmm. (gasps) (laughs) It's most likely not a spaceship. A torpedo. It's like a space rock torpedo. Most of the objects in our solar system do not have that kind of a shape. uh, The objects in our solar system are usually Spherical in nature, oblate spheroids for sure, but we don't get these splinters or shards in the way that this one appears to be. So that's one note, another note that gives us more points to start investigating to figure out what could the forces at work have been to create this object? Has it been traveling through space? And an interesting question that my husband brought up, this thing has a reddish hue about it that uh, that suggests it's not surrounded by a cloud of dust in, in any way. It's just a smooth, rocky object. And the question is, as it's been traveling through space, is it possible that it's run into little uh, little pieces of dirt and dust in its galactic journey that have uh, shaped it in this way. Is this space erosion that we're seeing? Has it, because it's been traveling so far, is this why it's turned this way? This is not very likely though. We have many objects in our solar system traveling through space that have been traveling through space in then orbital paths that uh, have not ended up in this shape, even though they've probably impacted many things as well. So Maybe not space erosion, but it's interesting nonetheless. What would have made a splinter or a shard and sent it tumbling and spinning through space? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, what's, yeah, because m- most stuff that's floating around in space, it gathers, right? It does gather mm-hmm. uh, dust and things like that. Um, right. Maybe that this is having a non planular orbit around our solar system. Not planar, be- yeah. Non, not planar, non planar. Mm-hmm. Um, that might have something to do with it. It's getting out of the, the away from the dust uh, more than the other things are. Because uh, even even when we when we look at asteroids, they, it turns out they're big. A lot of them are big piles and uh, coagulations of, of gravel and dust and little bits. They're not all these big giant rocks that we imagine them to be. Huh. Yeah. So anyway, it just this one of these wonderful serendipitous discoveries where uh, the tele- a telescope was looking in the right place at the right time. It was the University of Hawaii's Pan Stars One telescope that is funded by NASA's Near Earth Object Observations Program. Basically, it's a program to look for 
asteroids and other objects that might impact the Earth. It was discovered mm-hmm. on October 19th. And it's normally looking for asteroids and comets kind of in our local neighborhood. And this, uh, the defense officer, planetary defense officer, Lindley Johnson said, we're fortunate that our sky survey telescope was looking in the right place at the right time to capture this historic moment. The serendipitous discovery is bonus science enabled by NASA's efforts to find, track, and characterize near earth objects that could potentially pose a threat to our planet. So it's suggested that it could have come from around the star Vega in the northern constellation of Lyra. Oh, and wait a second. Wait a second. What? Hold the hit the brakes. What? Wait, this is not for, this is not just a non-planetary no, orbiting object. Interstellar. This is Inter- this is from another star system. This is from another star yeah. system. Oh, it's definitely aliens then. <laughs> This is my question. Um, Would anything since ever travel through space unless they were an intelligent? <laughs> oh no, but that's way cooler than I thought this was. Even yeah, that's even I'm not just talking about a random asteroid. I, I mean, I am I missed, talking about I a random asteroid. Like but underheard what you said earlier because I totally missed that. <laughs> wow. So my, my question is: You said that that they found it. These people that found it were actually looking for uh, p- potential collisions. Um, for from objects with Earth, right? And you said that this object is moving towards us. Well, no, Will it's not it moving. Us? No, no, no. It's not moving towards us. It's in. It's passing through the solar system. Okay. So it's and a fly it's kind by. of at an angle. Us, so, us being the solar system. Yeah, and, and so it was <laughs> <laughs> yeah. the solar system. Us, the really, system. Exactly. larger not us than we're accustomed yeah. to. The larger us. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, so it was. Uh, it, yeah. it was classified as a comet originally, and observations then didn't really it, they observed it and they were like oh this doesn't really seem like a comet and then it slingshotted past the sun and since it slingshotted past the sun it's kind of you know the sun's gravitational field has kind of uh, warped the path slightly but it's basically our 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 solar system is on a plane and it is passing through in an angular plane uh transecting our uh, our solar system and it's uh, about now it's past the orbit of mars it's moving past the orbit of uh of of jupiter and it is it will eventually head past saturn and then it'll get too far away for us to really look at but we are going to be observing it all the way through our solar system as it passes and it gets below or it out of the plane of our of our solar system as it passes through um this uh, the name Oumuamua is Hawaiian for a messenger from afar arriving first and so just we happen to be looking in the right place at the right time to see it there have likely been other asteroids from other star systems that have passed through our solar system before, but this is the first time we've ever seen it. So that makes it a very big deal. And because of its strange shape and potentially looking at, all right, it came kind of from where Vega is, but since it's been traveling for 300,000 years or so, I mean, we don't even know how long it's been traveling. Could have been from something else, some other star, because things have moved around. But uh, there's, there are many questions to be asked, and this could tell us a little bit more about solar formation and yeah. galactic formation, even. Let's go get it. Let's, I, know. I know. Let's, let's send go. it. Let's, send let's grab a out. sample. Let's go get it. We <laughs> got a tractor beam yet? Is that a thing? Yeah. Yeah. Use it. That's pretty cool. Just send a little interstellar drone. Right? I mean, who it. knows? I mean, we're talking about sending robots to to far planets and far stars, right? Little robots that'll be just probes. What if this is an alien probe (gasps) just flying through space, picking up information and sending it back as it goes? We didn't pick up any signals from that at all, but you know. Well, but if they were doing that, wouldn't they make it less (laughs) conspicuous of a shape? No, that's exactly what you would do. Let's embed it in something that looks like an asteroid, but still, you know. Yeah. Uh, isn't gonna has has less of a profile, so it doesn't smash into stuff. Yeah, and I would say you know you worry about being aerodynamic, except that uh, space is a vacuum. So right, yeah, but you right. still don't want to run into things. 
That's right. Narrow, right? You don't want to be really broad. You want to be narrow. You won't run into things. This could have been a planned design, folks. Mm -hmm. Uh, In retrospect, it all makes sense. (laughs) <laughs> oh my goodness. Yeah. So science, you guys, that we're just funny talking right now. Don't take us seriously. I mean, science. Let's talk about the real science. Yes, yes, yes. Of synthetic biology at this oh, point in time. So uh synthetic biologists. We've been talking for years about the potential of synthetic biology to solve so many of humans' problems. We could basically put genes into bacteria to break down nuclear waste, to break down plastics, to do, to produce things for us. We can, we could create these little biological machines. Once we understand the language of DNA and cellular metabolism a little bit better, I mean, we're getting there, but What is to stop these engineered bacteria from going rogue? Oh, probably our body's natural defenses. Yeah, no, at this point in time, (laughs) that's, I mean, that's about it. But um, we really don't have any way to stop them from uh, going rogue and spreading. So if you take a bacteria and you put it in a a place to do some job and you've given it some gene, it's going to go do that and it's going to, succeed at it and it's going to multiply and it's going to keep doing that job. And oh yeah, there's this thing called horizontal gene transfer Mm -hmm. where bacteria can transfer their genes to other bacteria. And then maybe there's a bacteria that wasn't supposed to have that gene that gets it as well. And in, in some situations, it's like, oh, that's not such a big deal. But other situations, it could be a very big deal. And researchers have been, I mean, we don't want to end up in a planet covered in gray goo, right? Not at the top of my list, no. No, No. you know, we don't want little synthetic machines, bacteria or otherwise, creating, creating, creating and not having an off switch when we want it to be turned off. So researchers are trying to figure out how to make off switches or in the case of the Harvard Weiss Institute for Biologically Inspired Engineering that's led by faculty members, Pamela Silver and James Collin. Collins, they are creating kill switches for bacteria. And what these kill switches do is when the bacteria are outside of the parameters that there's environmental parameters they're supposed to be in, the kill switch causes them to commit suicide. And they have reported in a uh, new paper in Molecular Cell two new types of kill switches to address the challenges that they are up against. And these are very self-sufficient kill switches and stable in bacterial populations. So we know that there's a lot of chromosomal uh, mixing and matching and there is our mutations that arise. And so you don't want to put your kill switch in a place that is going to be undergoing a large amount of mutation and change. Mm -hmm. So they've put it in a fairly stable place. That in itself could be a problem too, though. But anyway. Right, because then then it gets out and there's horizontal gene transfer of the kill switch. switch. And then bacteria, which are used in, in living multitudes of environments, all of a sudden start dying off and then we're the gray sludge that's left at the end of the world. <laughs> like yeah, that's, so, so there is a, not good. Right. There's a balance that needs to be held here. But so far they're looking at a couple of kill switches that ensure that these bacteria that have the intact synthetic gene circuits survive and are confined to right now, 37 degrees Celsius body temperature. And if the temperature goes lower, it makes them commit suicide. And uh, they have they have a couple of kill switches. And seriously, this is like straight out of like the Terminator or something. The first kill switch is called the essentializer. The essentializer <laughs> is a memory element that allows E. coli bacteria to remember and encounter with a specific stimulus in their environment. And this is derived from bacteriophages and it either remains silent or reports the occurrence of a signal by turning on a reporter gene that can be traced by the scientists. And the signal can be just about anything and they've used an inflammatory cytokine in their particular study. 
And so they, do, they figured out how to make sure the memory element is not lost from the genome. And, uh, and they have this essentializer in one area. There's the memory element that stays intact and the essentializer. And um, <laughs> they have, as long as the memory element is intact in the genome, there are two bacteriophage factors that control its function that also inhibit expression of a toxin gene that the essentializer makes. So basically memory elements there. And as long as it's working, it sends a signal to the essentializer that says, don't make any more toxins. Don't make toxins. But this gene is a little bit leaky. And so there's a bit of toxin that always ends up in the cell. And then the researchers were like, oh, well, we need a second kill switch that can neutralize the toxin. And so they came up with the second kill switch that they call cryo death. I like that. Yeah, essential, the essentializer and cryo death. So the, there's the memory element, and then you've got the essentializer that makes a toxin. The memory element says, I'm still here. I'm still here doing my job and don't make any toxin. But the essentializer is like, Haha, I'm going to still try and make toxin. And then cryo death comes in and makes an antitoxin to neutralize the little bit of toxin that's leaking out. So the cell, the cell stays alive. But then at particular temperatures, cryo death says, nah, I'm not going to make any more antitoxin. And then the memory element might get messed up and then the toxin builds up in the cell and the bacteria dies there was an old lady who swallowed a fly <laughs> perhaps she'll die perhaps she'll <laughs> die uh, the uh, founding director donald ingberger from the weiss institute says this study shows how our teams are leveraging synthetic biology not only to reprogram microbes to create living cellular devices that can carry out useful functions for medicine and environmental remediation, but to do this in a way that is safe for us all. And the researcher, Pamela Silver, says, this advance brings us significantly closer to real-world applications of synthetically engineered microbes in the human body or the environment. We are now working toward combinations of kill switches that can respond to different environmental stimuli to provide even tighter control. So I get why they're doing this. Yeah. But, mm. but I honestly think it's unnecessary. I honestly think that the, the, the giant laboratory of bacteria sharing DNA, viruses, DNA, RNA, things floating around. I think when, when you take into the calculus, the millions upon millions of years, billions of years that these processes have been playing out, the idea that we're going to come up with one that's just wreaks havoc all of a sudden. Yeah. I mean, uh, it's happening now, Justin, in hospitals. And there's already kind of runaway um, adaptation in bacteria that we worry about those bacteria getting out and then uh, affecting other bacteria through horizontal gene transfer. So this is already happening in the natural world. So then when you take and you start tweaking things artificially, then you're you're compounding that effect. So I totally get it. And I think it's it's actually really smart. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know if I I don't know if I see this quite as the same as as using antimicrobials to train out uh, 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 deficiencies and or weaknesses in genes. It's quite the same. I think if I think of anything, uh, I'd be more afraid of the kill switches going rogue than I would the microbe itself because I think there's enough stuff that preys on microbes uh, that uh, that these little these little uh, fellows wouldn't stand a chance in the wider world of what nature has to throw at them. I mean, there is that possibility also that outside of the lab, many of these manufactured uh, bacteria wouldn't really survive in the world. They're hybrid poodles. But, yeah, exactly. But we don't know that I mean, for they're sure. Not, they're not, their constitution is untested in the actual world. Yeah, and there's another, there are a couple of other studies out uh, this week, actually, they are very interesting. One from PLOS Biology uh, that 
that and another that was published on bioarchive.org. And these papers uh, actually look into a, com it's a computer simulation, not looking at bacteria, but CRISPR gene drives that are introduced into DNA of larger organisms like mosquitoes. And a, a gene drive is a very specific, a specific method of genetic inheritance, where instead of like normal inheritance, where there's a 50% chance of a gene getting passed along to the offspring in the next generation, in gene drive inheritance, the gene actually has a bit of CRISPR in one of the genes, say, is in a male for the gene drive. And that has a little bit of CRISPR attached to it. And so during the reproduction process, the gene, the CRISPR gets activated and goes to the other chromosome from the other, from the other individual, from the female, cuts it and inserts itself into that gene before reproduction takes place so that there's a 100% chance of inheritance of the gene. And thus, instead of having a 50% chance of passing something on and it may be you know, it doesn't make it in the population, maybe dies out. With gene drive, it there's a higher than 50% chance of passing it on and the likelihood that it is inherited is almost always. And so uh, it's a very dangerous uh, question of if something were tweaked through one of these genetic drives and then uh, there were some stray animals mosquitoes that didn't fit into that somehow were able to uh or plants even where we've got genetically modified corn with uh with various compounds being produced if those through horizontal gene transfer as we just mentioned for bacteria or other methods if they got into other individuals uh this computer simulation says the event would have unknown potentially damaging ramifications. Kevin Esfeld of MIT, who's a co-author on both papers, says we need to get out of the ivory tower and have this discussion in the open because ecological engineering will affect everyone living in the area. And so the question of mosquitoes, where everybody's like, mosquitoes, it's okay. We had this conversation at the entomology conference mm -hmm. recently, you know, is it people aren't really going to cry too much about about mosquitoes dying out. And if many of them die out, um, the bigger point of what researchers are trying to do is get rid of malaria. So if you get rid of the vector for the malaria and all sorts of other diseases, um, you potentially solve a major human health problem. But is it worth it? And so, yeah, and so researchers are working on other models of gene drive inheritance. There's another that's called a, uh, it's called a daisy drive, where it just, it's kind of a, a pushy gene drive, but not as pushy, not, it's not 100%. So it doesn't always get inherited. And uh, another researcher, Anthony James of the University of California, Irvine says, we don't need our genes to last forever only long enough to contribute to getting rid of malaria. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think there was another kind of uh, uh, takeaway from the entomology uh, conference when we were talking about mosquitoes, which is that one breed of mosquitoes that was here in the United States, then another uh, species of, of mosquitoes sort of became invasive. And upon mating, the native species would become sterile immediately, first mating. So... So when you look at these things too, you know, when we talked about the fears of something like a gene drive that would have 50%, but almost certainly be inheritable, you know, we had an insect on insect thing that was 100% sterilizing one form of insect. And yet it, uh, the, the native species has survived and is now making a comeback after being pretty much decimated and replaced. Mm -hmm. but, but I think there's an analogy for a lot of what we think is new and frightening that science is doing somewhere in the natural world that has played out that might not be the end of anything. <laughs> it, that this, is, this is a lot of the times it's going to be a, a, a reworking of, of an ecosystem. But if we're, if our, if we're targeting malaria, uh, which is a really big killer of humans, you know, probably not, not just probably, but it's going to ultimately be worth doing. 
Absolutely. And so, and what another researcher who published a paper also in Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences on a different form of a gene editor that uses an RNA guide, um, he, he says a thousand children die every day and it would be unethical not to use a tool that could lessen that loss. But he does say, <laughs> also, a lot of pet owners would be sad if a gene drive went wrong and escaped worldwide, worldwide during some future attempt to rid, uh, right. rid a pest species, say feral cats, for, for instance. Right, yeah, or let's, right. let's not try this one. Well, on yeah. But the other side of this, too, is that, you know, we recently learned that mosquitoes are pollinators. And so to to know how things are going to work out, to know, for example, if um, something's going to get out that then affects the pollinator mosquitoes or if it jumps to Mm -hmm. another insect species that is a pollinator, the the fallout from that could potentially be even larger if you lose food. So I think it's really important to look at the fact that, you know, everything's connected in an ecosystem and the earth is one giant ecosystem. And so to not do the due diligence of exactly what is what has the potential to occur when you introduce something new, whether it be a new organism or whether it be a new climate or whether it be new genes, there is going to be an effect. So we have to be at least be prepared for what those effects might be. Yeah, I don't know how, how often yeah. horizontal gene transfer from a mosquito to anything is really going to happen now. That's it's already it's been shown actually there yeah. there are there is horizontal gene transfer that that takes place and it's been shown already in the wild so yeah I think it was I want to say it was yeah to pigs I don't I don't know huh? exactly. I don't, I can't, I don't, I'm gonna look it up what? in the break okay right. look it up in the break but the question yeah. is that everyone should be thinking of as we move into this. Uh, engineered ecology, synthetic biology, these things that were science fiction at one point in time, but are becoming more and more part of our solutions to modern problems. Will they be safe for release into the wild? And if they aren't yet, what will make them be? Will these kill switches be part of that, the, that solution? And those are the and questions the answer will we still, talk about. will still always be maybe. Yeah, exactly. yeah, maybe. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. More conversation needed. So, <laughs> Justin, what do you have? I have spontaneous contractions of the digestive tract, which might Uh-oh. not sound like. Oh, really is it time for a break? <laughs> <laughs> might not sound like the best of things to have, but turns out spontaneous contractions of the digestive tract are essential to the digestive process. From simple invertebrates to perhaps less simple humans, there are similar patterns of movement through, uh, through which rhythmic contractions of the muscles facilitate the transport and mixing of the bowel's contents to its exit point. These contractions are known as peristalsis. With diseases of the digestive tract, such as severe inflammatory bowel diseases in humans, there are disruptions of this activity. So recent research from a research team at the Cell and Developmental Biology Working Group at the Zoological Institute at Keele University has been able to prove that bacterial colonization of the intestine plays an important role in controlling peristaltic functions. The scientists published the results, the latest issue of scientific reports. The triggers for the normal spontaneous contractions of the muscle tissue are so-called pacemaker cells. So these are cells of the nervous system that in a specific rhythm are triggered to sort of emit electrical impulses that reach the muscle walls of the intestines and cause them to contract. The impulses occur by themselves. Their frequency intensity, though, it turns out are due to some external influences. Quote a voice from Professor Thomas Bosch lead to the study, which is entitled Origin and Function of Metaorganisms. The example of the simple freshwater polyp hydra has shown us that the bacterial colonization of the organism can affect the contractions of its digestive cavity. Most likely, they do so by modulating the underlying pacemaker signals. <coughs> the hydra 
is a microscopic invertebrate with a tube-like body comprised of tentacles, a mouth, and an adhesive foot. It's quite possibly the closest thing to an immortal on Earth. That is thought to be completely unaffected by the aging process. Uh, unlike more complex organisms, the hydra have no bowel. Their simple body cavity assumes, amongst other things, the function of a digestive tract. Surrounding tissue also exhibits the typical contractions associated with more highly developed intestines. To find out how peristalsis uh, is regulated in the freshwater polyps, the researchers compared normal hydra, which had the typical bacterial colonization, with those that had their microbiome, microbiome completely removed with an antibiotic cocktail. In comparison, these organisms, without their bacterial colonization, exhibited a reduced uh, reduction in contractions by about hmm. half. Half. Fascinating. At the same, yeah, right? Like, who here has had a, like, like done antibiotics and then had, like, a really hard time passing? <laughs> like, after. I mean, I, I know that's correlative that for me, like, that isn't what this study is saying, but that's the effect it had in this uh, very simple intestinal system. Uh, so yeah, by about half. At the same time, the rhythm of the movements became disrupted. Some of the breaks between the contractions were much longer. Thus, the absence of the typical microbiome and hydra compromised the peristaltic movements in the body cavity. Next, the researchers restored bacterial colonization to the hydra. Initially, they introduced each of the five most common bacterial species found in the hydra microbiome individually. So uh, back into the back into the pop. So into the uh, the sterilized or you know anti anti back hydra. Mm -hmm. So turns out that these one offs, individual bacterial colonizations, had no appreciable effect on the frequency and timing of contractions. So they did all five one by one in separate. Hydras, nothing, didn't change it. Then they did the joint reintroduction with all five of the main representatives of the microbiome together. And le that led to market improvements in the peristalsis. That's interesting. Okay, so the oh. antibacterial, it gave antibacterial to a certain group of the hydra, decreased mm -hmm. their contractions, their, their gut chamber motility and then when they introduced individual species back nothing happened they put all five popular uh, species back in there and then they had improvement had improvement not completely normalized though so yeah. oddly it seems like it takes the entire village of the microbiome mm -hmm. to normalize these contractions uh, they also noticed that an extract produced from the colonizing bacteria had a similarly positive influence so it's something that this bacterial colony is creating that's then having the effect, they would say. So, uh, yeah, from these observations, Kiel Research Team concluded that only the natural hydra microbiome, characterized by a balance between the bacterial species present, can play an important pacemaker role in peristalsis. Uh, they discovered that in this case, certain molecules secreted by the bacteria can intervene in the control mechanism of the pacemaker cells. As such, bacterial signals can have a decisive effect on the pattern of spontaneous peristaltic contractions. We're able to demonstrate for the first time in our simple model organism, the microbiome has an indispensable function in the frequency and timing of tissue contractions, says Bosch. In addition, uh, the example of evolutionarily ancient model organism Hydra shows us the control of vital processes of multicellular organisms by their bacterial symbionts originated very early in the yeah. evolution of life. I mean, that's yeah, yeah. that's the great big takeaway here is this this symbiosis thing that we got going with the microbiome and the gut microbes controlling or being involved in our being able to be on the planet and living organism has been going on since we've had living organisms on this planet, it appears. Yeah, that, and that's an important piece of information for us to get. So it's the fact that we think, oh, we're special. We've got this microbiota. 
you know, how long has it been important to us? Well, as long as we've been alive, as long as our, as, as we've been evolving yeah. forever. Yeah, you we, don't get we we're multicellular and in, involved. Yeah, we're multicellular little things interacting with bi- bacteria we're and tubular tentacled one mouth sticky footed creatures got the right. same, well, same you, kind of micro. So I, th- shut awesome. up. I think about when I when I talk to people about koalas Even, because they have a very particular type of bacteria that allows them to digest eucalyptus, right? Mm-hmm. That they have to eat their mom's poop when they're babies in order to get the bacteria that they need to eat the eucalyptus. I let, talk about the koala like they're sourdough bread, right? So you have to you have to get that mother dough in there to get them going. We are like uh, sourdough bread that is millions of years old <laughs> starting back from uh from hydra yeah we had this <laughs> this mother bacteria that has grown and evolved with us the and mother. is seeding the following generation and also and also what's what's is, like i mean the the symbiosis from going all the way back but also that that is hierarchically speaking more important in a way or more essential part of our digestive system than the actual you know evolutionary changes to the structure of right the architecture yeah right? like like <laughs> it's it's it evolved we evolved around having a microbe that was microbes that were doing this And not the other way. It's not like they just took advantage of a nice spot within the digestive tract. The digestive tract was designed around these critters being there and doing what they do. I wonder though. That's a good research. It's a good direction of research, you know, to study these smaller multicellular organisms and look at their microbiomes. This is a quicious one. Yes. We all feel more cultured now. That one brand of yogurt that really makes you go because it's probiotic. I wonder if it's because that particular probiotic really makes those contractions start happening. <laughs> Let's accentuate <laughs> the peristalsis. There yeah. we go. Yeah. And on time that <laughs> note, on that note, it's time for us to. No, it's not time for us to go. It's time for Blair's Animal Corner with Blair. She loves our creatures. Biped, milliped, no pet at all. If you want to hear about animals, she's your girl. Except for giant pandas and squirrels. And a What you got, Blair? Well, I'll tell you right now, I don't have any turkeys for you today. I do. I brought those for later. Oh, good. Yeah. So instead, in the oh, animal oh, oh, oh. corner, I wanted to talk about you know, reproduction. <laughs> Shocking let's, change in pace, right? Let, let's keep it going. Let's yeah. keep it. Let's keep so it. I wanted to talk about dolphins in particular, um, something that we've talked about a bunch on this show before, dolphins that use sponges. So um, humpback dolphins in Australia have been found using sponges. Uh, as early as the 1980s, we first saw some dolphins using these sponges. We found out that they're most likely using these sponges as a tool to feel across the, the ocean floor so that they don't poke their poor snoot with anything like an urchin or an anemone. Instead, they can use that sponge as a tool, as a buffer to scare out to kind of smoke out the um, bottom dwelling fish so that they can then go hunt for those bottom dwelling fish that are um, actually higher quality food items and in some ways a lot easier to catch than schooling fish. So these sponges were found to be used as a tool. Then more recently, I think a couple of years ago on the show, I reported about how we found that there were actually two ty- types of dolphins. There were the sponger dolphins and the non-sponger dolphins. Mm-hmm, and there were these social cliques involved. Well, the sponge plot thickens. Oh. Um, a recent study from the University of Western Australia found sponges used in sexual display. They actually found evidence of male humpback dolphins presenting females with large marine sponges in an apparent effort to mate. 
Um, so they actually did over a decade of boat-based research on these coastal dolphins across northwestern Australia. They were all just observational. And they found uh, quite a few examples of humpback dolphins presenting these sponges to females, along with visual and acoustic displays. This is the first time this is this be behavior has been documented in this species and actually in quite a few uh, species. We haven't seen a lot of behavior where there's presentation of gifts. We've seen it a few times. Obviously, spiders, we talk about that all the time. Um, we talk about it in birds of prey. Males will bring a kill to a female to see if that's good enough for her. And then if not, they get chased away. Right. And so this is um, not unheard of, but definitely unusual. And particularly in the marine world, we don't see a lot of this. So um, they say that the findings actually suggested an as of yet unrecognized level of social complexity in humpback dolphins, which since we already reported that they have social cliques, I can't say I'm too surprised that there's social complexity. Um, so the one of the co-authors um, said, here we have some of the most socially complex animals on the planet using sponges, not as a foraging tool, but as a gift, a display of quality, or perhaps even as a threat in behavioral context of socializing and mating. So there are even added elements of this. They also saw some examples of male dolphins working together in pairs to find the best sponges, which seems very unadvantageous because they're directly competing for females. So there's a lot of complex stuff going on here. But what they see that is pretty clear is that males are bringing high quality sponges to females in, in conjunction with mating attempts. Next, they hope to determine through new research, through behavioral observation and genetics, whether or not the sponge presentation and engaging in sexual displays actually improves on mating success. Hmm. Yeah, so, that makes sense. Yeah. yeah. I, I mean, I, I don't know that I've ever given anybody a sponge. <laughs> but, you know, oven mitts, maybe, maybe some nice soaps. This holiday know. season. It seems like just a thoughtful, thoughtful Valentine's Day gift. Maybe next time, next Valentine's Day, maybe I'll... <laughs> I'll present it's the holidays, Justin. Anybody? There's there's lots of opportunities for sponges. Yeah, I love this idea though that it's a useful tool that yeah. the dolphins use. That they, it's like I'm going to protect my beak while I'm smashing down under rocks, and I'm I'm not going to hurt my nose. Oh. And then, I want to hurt their very important nose that senses things. Yeah, and so they've got this soft sponge that they use, and then it's like, hey, look, I like you. I'm going to give you my favorite sponge. My favorite sponge. You can it protect so your much. nose too. I like I like you. Yeah, <laughs> I'm going to give you my favorite sponge. And yeah. now from vertebrates to invertebrates, the courtship straight to the main show, I bring you a story about twisted snail sex. So uh, previously, we've talked a little bit on maybe it was in the after show, actually, about Jeremy, the sinister snail. Do we remember this? He was mm -hmm. a left twisting snail. They were trying to find him some mates because the, the expectation was and what they had previously observed in the wild. All uh, snail researchers had discovered that um you have to be twisted the same way to be able to reproduce. The mechanics just don't work otherwise. And so they were looking for other sinister, other um, left twisting snails. And they found a couple. Um, they actually found a mate, Tamu, who actually uh, continued to be studied at Nottingham after Jeremy's recent passing very sad but tomu um actually was able to produce an offspring from their time together and so uh jeremy's legacy continues on tomu has certainly has recently been preserved lucky him her as part of a bid to be included in um a genome project where they're actually going to do dna blueprints for sinistral sales but the reason I bring all this up is that it is all based on the expectation that left twisting snails cannot reproduce with right twisting snails. Well, 
University of Nottingham found that differently coiled types of Japanese land snails actually can mate. So this actually has a ripple effect on our classification of snails. Because generally speaking, reproductive barriers are considered species barriers. And so differently coiled snails are therefore considered different species, even if they're very, very similar. Because we thought that different coiled snails couldn't mate. Correct. And so physical barrier, different species. Yes, exactly. And um, so this kind of takes it all (laughs) topsy-turvy. Haha, twists it all up. So uh, what they found was actually that they can overcome a insurmountable barrier of actually their genital, genitals being on the wrong side of their their head. So on one, it's coming out the right side, and on one, it's coming out the left side. When you try to mate face-to-face as they do, it, things don't line up properly. So what they actually end up doing is they twist their genitals so that they can still reproduce face to face. They're just they just twist around. They do some some yoga, I guess. <laughs> uh, but so in in this case, particularly, they were looking at um, Euhadra amoriensis and Euhadra caesita, and that's the right coiling and left coiling snails, um, respectively. They they were separate species. Now that they found that they can actually reproduce, they had to then start looking at genetics. And when they looked closer at the genomes, they are extremely similar genomically, which means... But they've been mating this whole time and we weren't paying attention. We were not paying attention. They've been mating this whole time and they are therefore one species. This now means we have to go back and look at snail species again. (sighs) Because there are all sorts of snail species that we have characterized based on coiling that now we have to reassess. Yeah, Blair, I'm still I'm a little confused. Yeah. How do snails Well, remember, Justin, snails are hermaphrodites. So they have male and female elements. And so but on the sides of their heads. And so most uh, yeah, Kiki's gonna look up a diagram, I feel like, right now, maybe. <laughs> um, but so most snails, they ha- they transfer both at the same time. So imagine if you will, there's the the coil of the snail shell. The head's coming out this way. Hello, here's the little snail head. And then um down here. There's the male bits, and on this side, there are the female bits. And so when you go up face to face, male is at female, female is at male on either side of the head. So therefore, if they're twisted the other way, and you have, you normally have your male uh, elements on your right side, but now they're on their left, that means your male elements are touching or near each other on one side and then they're the females are up against each other so they have to now it appears they do a nice twisting they do a little acrobatics to make everything line up right and so remember snails they're the whole torsion the whole twisting of their body um it actually means the back of them That's not where waste comes out. That's not where their reproductive tract is. It's all up near their head. It comes out near the front. That's just their foot that's coming out the back, quote unquote, foot, right? Um, Gastropod, stomach, foot. So their stomach is on top of their foot. So yeah, so it's all kind of near the front, which is why they go like this face to face when they reproduce. So... That was snail sex 101. Basically, what that means is mm. that that we now have to go back. We have to recategorize snails that are categorized solely based on their torsion. And we have to start looking at genetics much closer with these snail species. Uh, once again, this is just another case in the um, in the long line of stories that I have brought to this show that essentially all it says is, 
we classify species based on categories that we invent. And so when we say things like reproductive barriers make species, and then we have uh, animals that make hybrids and those hybrids are actually able to reproduce. And then you have left coiling snails and ref- right coiling snails that are actually reproducing. So it, it, cl- it kind of muddies the waters, it clouds these barriers, these, um, these parameters that we make. So uh, uh, like uh, nature finds a way. Nature finds a way. Nature does not put things in boxes. Nature Whatever doesn't you care say. about our stinking characteristics. Nature doesn't care that we have to rewrite invertebrate biology textbooks everywhere now. Jeez. But I think it's great. I mean, this is, yeah, we, ju- we just learned something new. Yeah. This will, it change, it'll change the way that we look at snails yes. and their twistiness from here on out. We, we won't discriminate. We won't categorize them into separate little boxes no longer yeah we'll actually wait to see who's who's mating with whom yeah absolutely so just just don't you snails you sinistral snails who are saying that you can't find a nice right coiled snail to settle down with don't believe the hype you sinistral snails. You shoot for... Th- and on that note, it is time for us to take a quick break. This is This Week in Science, and we will be back in just a few moments with more science news. We have lots of great stories. I've got some turkey for you, because it is twist giving. And I have another story following on the heels of Justin's uh, microbiome and gut story. I've got some more of that ahead. Digestion and turkey. That's what we're going to be talking coming up here. So stay tuned. This is This Week in Science. Hey, everybody. This is This Week in Science. Thank you so much for watching, listening, for engaging in the world of science with us. This is our show, and we're so glad that you are here enjoying it with us. It is that time of year. It's uh, Thanksgiving week, Twistgiving, and this Friday is Black Friday. And I know everybody's going to be going to the internet in or going to stores or the internet in search of deals, deals, deals. Well, you know what? I don't know if I have any deals for you, except that every time you go to the internet, maybe consider going to twist.org and looking at our store, considering whether or not you're able to donate. Maybe if you haven't gotten a calendar, maybe think about checking out our calendar for yourself or for somebody else because it is that time of year. You're out shopping already. Consider making twists a part of your shopping plans. So this week in science, we have our Blair's Animal Corner Twist 2018 calendar that is now available. We should be getting them in any day now and we'll be mailing them to people soon. But right now you can place your order on our website. You click on the link with the black and white toad on the cover of the calendar that'll take you to a paypal interface where you can order the calendar and i'll mail it to you i'll stick it in the mail and i will mail it to you i will before the holidays that's right but no not before thanksgiving but after thanksgiving before the end of year holidays hopefully we'll get them to you Beyond that, we also have our Zazzle store. So you can click on the Zazzle store link and that'll take you to the place where you find all the things twisty and goody, twists, sciencey goodness. We have a polo shirt. Do you need a professional shirt? Something that looks a little bit nicer than a regular t-shirt? The twists polo shirt is amazing. It's not that bad a deal. And we are, right now there's a deal going on 30% off with code Zone Day Deal 3 on Zazzle products. The proceeds of all of these items do go to support twists. So you will be doing double duty with your holiday shopping by buying some of our goods. Does someone you know need a lumbar pillow? Because we have a pretty amazing mammoth lumbar pillow. There's some t-shirts with cool tortoises toads, tyrannosauri, all sorts of things for you, for your loved ones who enjoy science, who might enjoy twists. 
Come on, come on. I know you want to get out there and shop and support Twist in the process. If you're not into the shopping and the stuff, well, maybe just consider supporting Twist directly. So you can do that by clicking on the donate button that's on the side of our twist.org page. You can also do that by clicking on the Patreon link that'll take you to our Patreon page. At patreon.com slash this week in science, you can become a patron and help to support Twist in an ongoing fashion. And we will send you some cool little goodies for your support at various levels. Come on, help us out. Another way you can directly help us that's not financial, but does have a big influence on us is by sharing twists. So if you simply go to social media, share twists, share the most recent episode of twists, ask people, you know, to subscribe, tell them, Hey, are you traveling places this holiday? Do you need something to listen to in the car on those long drives or on those flights? I know the best podcast, Science, This Week in Science. Help them get, take their phone from them and help them install or subscribe to Twists on their phone. Make it happen. But really, we appreciate all of you who are here with us and who are helping us by listening and by watching and being a part of the program. We really could not do any of this without you. Thank you for your support. And we're back with more this week in science. Yes, we are. Justin, what you... Oh, wait, nope. Nope, never mind. I have... Pause that. Pause it. It's time for our segment this week in What Has Science Done For Me Lately? Lately. That's right. What has science done for me lately? Oh, so much. So much. But you know what? Minion Tedward Lecoute has written in and says, what has science done for me? Drugs that simultaneously fixed my depression and my insulin resistance. Which is fabulous. Yes, the science of pharmacology is amazing. Our ability to be able to target systems of the body with pharmaceuticals to be able to help people function in everyday life and continue to lead active, wonderful lives. That is an amazing addition. Seriously, that's wonderful. Thank you for writing in, Tedward. Everyone out there, I need you. This is, your, this is the time. I know you're going to be doing all of your Thanksgiving gratitude, platitudes, writing things down. I'm thankful for this. I'm thankful for that. I have gratitude for this. I have grat- You know what I need you to do? Include in there what you are thankful for about science. What does science do for you every day, every week? What has it done for you lately? And send me a message on Facebook. I need it. I need it. I do. I don't have any more scheduled. I got nothing. I got nothing scheduled right now. I need, I need somebody to write me who has not written before to share something that science has done for them lately. Come on, you can do it. Be Otherwise, that it'll just me droning on about how much I, I appreciate dishwashers. <laughs> so there's <laughs> I, gotta I, be better there. There's gotta be better, although I do really love dishwashers. Uh, really now, if we could just get a robot dishes. to bring the dishes from the dishwasher and put them away. Oh, come on now, Blair. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously. But that is science. And so, everyone out there, I need you. Send me your messages on Facebook, facebook.com slash this week in science. Find us, leave us a message, please. I need you to fill this segment of the show. I don't want it to go away. Do you? I don't. Help me keep this going. Help us be inspired continually. All right, Justin, what do you got? I have quite possibly the biggest story of the year. Yeah, at least I think so. Okay, and don't oversell are, it. <laughs> while we are all the center of our own lives, nevertheless, the most abundant life form on the planet is not us. <laughs> Nor is it fish, fungi, insects, or even bacteria. But bacteria 
phages, bacteriophages, viruses that infect bacteria are the most abundant life form on the planet. Bacteriophages, a.k.a. phages, are everywhere, including the food that we eat and are responsible for the majority of global genetic diversity. Phages constitute integral components of our gut microbiome. They carry a rich repertoire of genes and impart strong selective pressures on our bacterial hosts, as we mentioned uh, before on this show in the past. Newborns are born with a robust viral phage constituent that predestines our microbiome to be beneficial in building our immune system. And throughout our lives, our bodies are frequently and continuously exposed to such high numbers of phages that for every gram of human feces, there are several billion phages leaving with it. Important to note that basic understanding of microbiology tells us phages do not, well, they do infect uh, prokaryotic cells like bacteria, but not eukaryotic cells, the U and eukaryotic means the cells that you and I consider us. That is not what the U stands for. <laughs> but okay. <laughs> no, that's, that's what it means to me. Okay. Nevertheless, they find ways to freely and profusely penetrate our persons. They have been detected in the blood and serum, lung, liver, kidney, spleen, urinary tract, and even in the brain, indicating the capacity of these viruses to cross the blood-brain barrier, which the more we learn about, looks less and less like a barrier. Uh, the gut is the largest reservoir of phages in humans. And while there are a few routes by which phages can hypothetically possibly enter the body via leaky gut, where cellular damage at sites of inflammation allows the viruses to sneak through, by way of Trojan horse, whereby uh, a phage-infected bacteria is engulfed by epithelial cells, and a few other ways in which there is supporting and contrasting evidence for possible mechanisms. But what if there were a more direct, less complicated method of human infiltration at play? Enter phage researcher Jeremy Barr of Monash University in Melbourne. Barr's earlier research showed that phages might naturally help protect us from pathogens. Studying animals ranging from corals to humans, he found that phages are more than four times as abundant in mucus layers, like the ones that protect our gums and gut than they are in the adjacent areas. Hanging out in mucus enables these phages to encounter more of their bacterial prey. As a result, Barr showed, the viruses protect the underlying cells from potential bacterial pathogens, providing an additional layer of Im immunity. In his recent research, his team showed in a lab dish setting that human epithelial cells, such as those that line our guts, lungs, and the capillaries surrounding the brain, take up phages and transport them across their interior. The transport mechanism remains unknown, but the researchers spotted viruses even enclosed in vesicles within the eukaryotic cells. The yeah. cells consistently took up phages on the side that would face sort of outward and released them on the opposite inward facing side. So it would be like from a gut lining, if it were in an actual, you know, human gut model, from the gut part that's facing the stuff that's in your stomach into the interior of your body, a.k.a. transcytosis of bacteriophage. And while they did this a mere 0.1% of the time, doing so at all changes our basic understanding of some microbiology and is still good enough for an estimated 31 billion transcytosed bacteriophages a day in an average human host. 31 billion a day. Yeah. So bacteriophages are not only crossing into our cellular space from the outside, they are also potentially getting into, they're getting into the cells. Mm-hmm. They're in our bodies. They're doing. They're there, and maybe they are helping protect us. Right. Maybe they, you know, they're they're in their in our mucus. They're helping to attack bacteria, certainly. So that's an optimal place. But in our gut, maybe they're helping to protect us as well from errant bacteria. What are they doing inside our cells, though? 
Right. So are, correlated, they, and, are these and, vesicles and, going to dispose of them or are these vesicles, well, what are they doing there? Yeah. And it could be that these were just some that were caught in the, in the midst of being trans, uh, cyto toast. Yeah. And cytotized. Like they were, maybe they caught them on the way through. They got stuck. They don't know. Correlative light, the electron microscopy and cell fractionations revealed that the phage particles were capable of accessing endo endomembrane compartments of the eukaryotic cell. Chemical inhibitors suggest that phages transit through the goglia apparatus before being exotized, ex, exo, exocytosed, before they leave. Yeah, before they, <laughs> get, before they results, get pushed out of the cell. Based on these results, researchers suggest the human body is continually absorbing phages from the gut, transporting them throughout the cell structure and subsequently the body. These results reveal that phages interact directly with the cells and organs of our bodies, likely contributing to human health immunity and, and, and potentially represent an unexplored totally. third external genome. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, it would be unexplored at this point. We've, we've just been, I mean, our last couple of years of this show have been, oh, the, the biome, the microbiome, the genes within our microbiome, within these microbial, we have to factor into that everything we know about biology, we have to factor in everything we know about human health to these microbes that are here. And now, now there's billions of viral phages penetrating our bodies doing we don't know what with genes that we aren't accounting for and their activities are going to take us to a whole other layer of understanding human health. But whatever well, you're doing, phages, don't stop. Because <laughs> it's probably related to me being alive right now. Yeah. How fascinating. That's right. a, a so, whole you know, new thing of what do we need to know that right. we don't know? What do we need to yeah. know? And it's, it's far too soon to jump to speculative conclusions uh, for scientists, but we can do that. Like yeah. all of the, all of these things that we've sort of started to figure out, like, wow, a disease that's actually caused by maybe a constituent of bacteria being missing or the, you know, um, all of these, all these different angles and directions that medical research has gone uh, in the last four or five years. And now we find out there's this whole other playing field that we weren't even looking at. And, and now to start even, I don't even know how you would start with there being billions of these, uh, these phages coursing through us. But, uh, but now we have to, like, do they, do they, they make, I mean, they what end do, up in our blood and our cells, our tissues. What are they but, doing there? What do they do? do? Are they in our brains? Are they all, because Probably. there's a massive connection between our guts and our brains. So are they involved is, in that as well? Is there, a, is there problems if you don't have enough phages? Is this leading? Is this a connection? Are there correlations between diseases and the types of phages or the lack of types of phages or that? That's a whole thing. Like, no, dude. <laughs> A whole new realm of science opens up from this one yep. study. It's just awesome. That is fantastic. All right, everybody. Lots of graduate projects out there in, bac yeah. in, in phage, not bacteriophage anymore, but the human phages that are in our cells. Wow, that's big. So uh, really interesting piece of news. And another story for the gut and microbes and the brain, according to an article out of The Scientist by Jeff Asked, Jeff Acts, I can't pronounce her last name, Axed. Jeff Axed. Uh, she has she went to the Society for Neuroscience meeting this last week in Washington and came back with a bunch of stories related to the gut brain connection. Uh, researchers at the University of North Dakota reported on a study in which they looked at the gut microbes of mice with Alzheimer's like disease pathology and healthy mice. And they found differences between the two groups, surprise, surprise, in the microbiomes. And then they tested uh, for gut leakiness and also inflammation, markers for inflammation. And they've, they found that when they treated them, with probiotics, the probiotics decreased the gut leakiness, it decreased uh, inflammation, and also increased memory performance. Huh. 
Yeah. So this is an Alzheimer's type uh, animals. In another study from the University of Kentucky, researchers compared the microbiomes of uh, diseased and healthy animals, mice that had the ApoE gene in various variants. And this ApoE gene we've talked about before is linked to Alzheimer's risk in humans. And they found that there were differences in the microbial profiles of the mice with the different ApoE gene variants. So maybe these gene variants have some kind of association with the gut microbiome, or maybe it's the other way around. I don't, maybe they're connected some, some way that way. Another one, Parkinson's disease. Researchers at the Vancouver Coastal Health Research Institute uh, talked about exposing rats to a compound called beta cetoserol glycoside, which is a neurotoxin that can cause symptoms that are similar to Parkinson's disease in lab animals. And it led to levels of a marker of inflammation called CD68 going up in the gut. And so the researchers said inflammation in the lining of the gut may be indicative of Parkinson's disease development as much as it brain inflammation. And then the question is, chicken or the egg, which comes first? University of Bordeaux's Institute of Neuro Neurodegenerative Diseases. They took a uh, uh, cellular uh, masses called Lewy bodies that had been purified from people who died of Parkinson's disease. And they, uh, they took those purified Lewy bodies and injected them into either the brains or the guts of monkeys. Now, Lewy bodies can be used as a marker to, um, to diagnose either Parkinson's disease or other related disorders like the one uh, that Robin Williams died from. And so they found that when they injected these Lewy bodies into the brains or the guts of the monkeys, either treatment caused pathology that was indicative of Parkinson's disease in both tissues. So inflammation in the gut and uh, aggregates building up in the brain and neuronal death after two years. So basically, if they put the Lewy bodies in the gut, it caused inflammation in the gut and the brain. If they put the Lewy bodies in the brain, it caused inflammation or death in the brain and the gut. Oh. So the, the researcher says, today we're left with the question of the chicken and the egg. We don't know where it starts. Uh, although I always have to interject, it, it's always, the answer is always the egg came first. <laughs> there were eggs before chickens. I'm just it, saying, it's, it's the as cellular far as the way works. Go. I know, people use chicken and egg because it's a funny old joke, but yeah. Yeah, so brain, egg. gut, degenerating brain, and maybe diet is involved. Uh, researchers also showed that valeric acid, which is a metabolite of fiber, interferes with the aggregation of alpha-synuclein and the formation of aggregates, suggesting that diet-gut microbiome interactions might contribute to uh, Parkinson's disease as well. Wow. So quite a few things coming out as people start looking and digging deeper and deeper and deeper, just in this show alone. I mean, with these stories that from, uh, these are all, of course, abstracts and the research is uh, being published and peer reviewed as we as we go. But these other studies like the one you've talked about with the phage, and also earlier uh, in the show, I mean, it's just every show we've got something just about it's amazing. Yeah, And we were remember just if they, uh, when we started the show, we were starting to talk about the genetic links between things. And, and that was going to be it, right? It was all once we deciphered that our own genome, like then we would have <laughs> and then, oh, but then there's these epigenetic effects. And oh, then it's bacteria. Oh, and it could be viruses. And it's such a huge, complicated thing just to be a human. And you don't even know it's all going on. Yeah. Do you have another story? Yes. Uh, this is, uh, where is it? This is natural, uh, National Institute of Health Scientists in collaboration at Case Western Reserve University School of Medicine have detected abnormal prion protein in the skin of nearly two dozen dead people. What makes this uh, especially of note? Cause of death for these individuals was Crutzfeld-Jakob disease. Crutzfeld-Jakob disease is an incurable 
ultimately fatal transmissible neurodegenerative disorder in the family of prion diseases. Prion diseases originate when normally harmless prion protein molecules become abnormal, gathering clusters and filaments in the human body. I think they do some sort of unfolding action too. Reason for this process is not yet fully understood. The accumulation of these clusters has been associated with tissue damage that leaves sponge-like holes in the brain. Human prion diseases include fatal insomnia, crew, <coughs> excuse me, getzman strausler schinker syndrome, invariant familial and sporadic Creutzfeldt-Jakob disease. Sporadic Creutzfeldt-Jakob disease is the most common human prion disease affecting about one in one million people yearly worldwide. Other prion diseases include scrapie in sheep, chronic wasting disease in deer, elk and moose, and bovine spongiform encephalopathy, aka mad cow disease in cattle. Uh, most people associate these prion diseases with the brain. Uh, although scientists have found that they can have these, inf- they get, you can have one of these infections in other organs. Uh, prion protein can, uh, problems can affect spleen, kidney, lungs, liver. Sporadic creutzfeldt jakob disease has been known to be transmissible by invasive medical procedures involving mm-hmm. central nervous system and the cornea. Which I, I didn't know. Like, that's how you could catch this, right? Uh, in this study, scientists also exposed a dozen healthy mice to skin extracts from two of the creutzfeldt jakob disease patients and they all developed prion disease. The study results published in Science Translational Medicine raised questions about the possible transmissibility of prion diseases via medical procedures involving skin and whether skin samples might be used to detect prion disease, which is really the fascinating thing, I think. Researchers from NIH's uh, Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases were co-leaders of the study which included many collaborating groups, they stressed that the prion seeding potential found in skin tissue is significantly less than what they have found using brain tissues. Uh, it's a thousand to a hundred thousand times lower on the skin samples than in brain tissue samples. But uh, yeah, using a test for prion diseases known as real-time quaking-induced conversion Scientists analyzed skin tissue from 38 patients, 23 who had died from crutchfield jakob disease, and 15 who died of completely different causes. They were able to correctly detect abnormal prion protein in each of the 23 who had died from the crutchfield jakob disease sample, and they didn't detect it in any of the non crutchfield jakob disease group. So, ta-da, this is a fantastic test then. They used humanized mice for their experiment. This is mice with some kind of functioning human genes, cells, tissue, organs. They've been hybridized a little bit. Scientists exposed the humanized laboratory mice to their brain or skin extracts from two of the patients. All 12 mice inoculated with brain tissue developed prion disease, as did all 12 inoculated with the skin extracts. Though they point out that the skin group took 400 days about as opposed to the 200 days to actually develop the disease. The group also reported that brain degeneration in both groups of infected mice was similar. Study authors say the results should generate discussion about potential surgical instruments, contamination risk, and maybe, you know, doctors washing their hands. Uh, perspective. Well, they already, I mean, they're already, I mean, they've been talking about that for years and years and years, uh, you know, surgical instruments that they've, uh, they know that there is some transmission risk after, uh, these kinds of diseases are, if they, if they catch it and they assert, they operate, they do something, they have to throw away those surgical in- instruments very often. They know that now. Uh, they know that they can't just wash them normally, that the that the prions don't come off. Um, they know that h- simple hand washing isn't just going to do it. Um, yeah, so I don't know. I mean, what else is, what is this telling us so much more? I mean, this yeah, is... Okay, it's in gloves, the, sanitary it's in, equipment. It's in the it's skin good. too. So it's in the skin too. We, we know, yeah. but so far we haven't ever really seen like transmission from touching that's never been something that has been uh, documented before. So, but we okay, didn't know to, in, to 
Take, so, so Kiki, look. question. Um, normally, when we're testing for prions in people um, for these sorts of diseases, do you have to take brain tissue samples if you're testing? Yes. Usually, or, yeah, yeah. Or a, um, so that's really the benefit here, right? Is right. that or you can test fluid. for these things. Yeah, spinal Yikes, fluid. Spinal yeah. fluid. So you can right. test for these things potentially from a skin sample. Using real time yeah, okay, quaking induced conversion. Yeah, that's that. That's I think that I think that probably is the highest and best from this study. Right? Is that mm -hmm. you don't have to get a brain sample from somebody. You don't have to get. Yeah, you won't. You don't have to be as invasive. Just mm -hmm. taking a skin sample. Look, I gave my I gave my skin to some hot glue this week. Oh, oh well done. So yeah, that it's, you know it's 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 all the time. Skin samples, yeah. no problem. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, medical treatment. Intense crafting, potato, potato. Yeah. 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 So, okay. So it's not as it, the, the, the prions, the folding, it's not uh, seen as at great, as great a concentration as in the brain tissue, but it is, you can see it there in the skin. Yeah, and, and, and also just to be clear, the mice in this study, the humanized mice were inoculated directly into their brains. They weren't Yikes. just like, they weren't just rubbed. Right. With the skin and then got the disease. But it, so again, this get, that's gets at that question of the, the blood brain barrier that we've mm -hmm. talked about for so long being uh, how much of a barrier is it if <laughs> you're in, injecting directly into the brain and then there is a, uh, a outbreak or there are cellular effects in the skin? Now that is, that's yeah. something to think about. Right. So that's, that was the thing I was trying to like, figure. like, is it being expressed out to the skin or does it just mean that there was that much contact that it finally found a way in further? Like that's there. You're right. That is like the big, uh, the, the big story there. How is it both places? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Getting to Why all the different tissues. Yeah. If you go, if, if you inject directly to the brain and not to the rest of the system, how is it moving through the entire body? I mean, prions are, uh, these prions are pretty small, but may, right. and maybe that's what it is. But and so, I so they, and I don't think that was established. So I don't think that they established that in this, like they inoculated the mice, but they didn't, I don't think they found it on the skin of the mice. I didn't see that anywhere. Right. It, it wasn't represented there. Mm -hmm. So, so the question Next study. is right. The question yeah. is still how the how the pa the dead patients had it both mm -hmm. in the brain uh, and right. and on the skin. Yeah, they found that what they were basically testing was: is this going to have the same to uh, toxicity result? Is it going to uh, replicate the disease if this these skin samples are inoculated into the brain of these mice? And it was. Um, but there is no evidence that transmission could occur just via touching because touch, they, yeah. haven't, they haven't done that and they didn't, they didn't, and they haven't come seen up with it a result yet. For the, and that's yeah. sort of weird. They've like, never seen they, it. yeah, it seems like they should like have like, at least maybe they, they did in the study and I'm not reading it here, but say whether or not they found it on the skin of the mice afterwards, it might not yeah. have been well, long lived enough. I don't know. One wonders if it's a one way mirror situation, right? So they can exit the brain. Can't get back in. But can't yeah. get back in. It's the brain drain. Right. Yeah. We can go from the brain to the skin, but not from the skin to the. Maybe. Yeah. Yeah. We'll see. We'll see. Yeah. Mm. But you know what's going to be moving from the kitchen to the table? Um, Tomorrow for mashed many people potatoes? in the United States. Pumpkin pie? Yeah, for you, Blair. But for many people in the United States, it's all about the turkey. The turkey. It is all about the turkey. The poor turkey that... Well, I'm not going to talk about the turkey that actually is making it to your tables. I'm going to talk about wild turkeys. Ooh. And bourbon? this is not the bourbon. Oh. No, actual <laughs> wild turkeys. The birds that live, there are wild turkeys. There are turkeys that live in nature, not grown by man. There's one that lives in my parking lot. They're like all over Davis. There's another, this is before we get to the story. Davis is inundated inundated with wild turkeys uh, to the point our friend Roy named a beer at his brewery downtown Tom 
for one particularly aggressive turkey that was actually going after people and chasing people downtown. But this is great because what's happening right now is that turkeys seem to be having, these wild turkeys seem to be having a little bit of trouble. So turkey populations across the United States during the 19th and 20th centuries declined precipitously. And at one point there was known only to be about a million turkeys in the United States. Now, conservation efforts that began in the tw- late 20th century uh, brought those numbers back. And so starting about like the, the 80s to 90s or, or 70s, 80s in there, turkey numbers increased and numbers actually hit a peak of over 6 million birds. Now, these are estimates. We don't know exactly how many birds, but the numbers have gone up, but not this year. Now they're starting to go back down. Something has happened and the wild turkeys are on decline. And now because the numbers have come back up, of course, hunting has been reinstituted. But it's not hunting's fault. Right. A lot of this, uh, the researchers say there are multiple factors that uh, the game laws that are in place right now are probably not the biggest part of it. That the game aspect of this is the part that has been helping them grow so much because hunters are really, you know, here in the United States, are really interested in actually bagging a turkey. They're not interested in going out and sitting around and not seeing anything thing because there are no birds there. So we want to make this, they want this sustainable, right? Mm -hmm. Anyhow, uh, uh, Pennsylvania Game Commission's wild turkey biologist, Mary Jo Casalena says the population was on such a rise and it had such momentum for a long period of time that as managers, we just didn't see it coming. And what they think the issues are is that uh, in the last 15 or so years, the drop has occurred because maybe there are new threats to these to the wildlife. The lands, landscape is changing. So young forests where during the, uh, the breeding efforts and the, the growth efforts that game managers were involved in, they'd take turkeys from one area and they would move them to areas that had suitable habitat for them. So turkeys like young forests where there's lots of underbrush and brambles, places they can, they can hide, places they can, uh, they can breed and they can have their nests safe from predators. But what has happened it's been 15 or so years after the beginning of those efforts, those 30 or so years now, the uh, forests have matured. And so there is less underbrush. There are less brambles. There's less places for them to hide out. And so in the spring and the fall, especially, they're really coming under a lot of pressure from predation. So the changing landscape is a part of it. But climate change is also a big part of it as well. Severe storms are more frequent during the springtime. And when those storms are more frequent, these turkeys are more likely to die off. And it's the weather can destroy nests. It can also make the birds themselves really wet. And when they get really wet, they get really stinky. And so they're more odorous and predators can find them because their smell is stronger. But young birds, the poults, they, uh, the young birds actually, well, they get wet and cold and start <laughs> crying to their parents. And so the young birds are too noisy. <laughs> so you're just going to get eaten up. Oh, man. Poults, yeah. Poults make too much noise and they get eaten. Uh, they have also, so, and additionally, a lot of the trees and the, the, that form the basis of the ecosystems, the trees are moving and the trees are dying as well. Um, A lot of trees are uh, the beech trees, especially, which are great forests for these birds have diseases like beech bark disease. There are grazing pests like invasive gypsy moths and also white tailed deer that eat uh, and damage a lot of the, the tree habitat that these birds rely on. Also, uh, predator numbers have gone up 
recently. So there's an increase in the top predators. And so the birds are going down. So maybe this is simply just a predator prey Mm -hmm. back and forth interaction. The predators are going up. The bird numbers are going down. Maybe when the bird numbers go down further, the predator numbers will fall and the birds will come back up. But there are more issues even. Turkeys also have another potential stressor, which is called lymphoproliferative disease virus. And it's a tumor-causing condition found in about 55% of wild turkeys in New York State alone. They don't necessarily show symptoms, however, so it's not really indicative of whether or not they're going, the the disease, the virus has an impact on the health of the birds, but it could be the kind of thing where if the birds are healthy, if they've got enough food, if conditions are right, the virus doesn't do anything but give us strong storms, a lack of food, not enough shelter and other stressors, and maybe that the virus can suddenly become uh, more detrimental to the bird's health. So there are a lot of questions Mm -hmm. about the future of the wild turkey in the United States. Right now, the numbers are good. The researchers and the uh, game managers are in no way saying that this is an alarm call, but they're looking at the numbers and they want to be very careful not to get to the low numbers where the turkeys once were. We need our turkeys. I mean, come on. The wild turkey really should have been the American bird. That's right. Benjamin Franklin was all about it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I think that's great. We we, we get the bald, dumb, bald eagles. No. (laughs) uh, Well, this is all about, you know, conservation dollars, monitoring populations, and noticing when things change before they've changed so much there's little to do. So I think that, you know, as we change landscapes, as we remove predators, then you need hunters to thin out populations so they don't overpopulate so that the sick individuals don't go on to create a bunch of offspring that then make sick individuals. But also as we build cities, right, that kind of divides habitats, which is why turkeys need to be relocated when or did back then because they Mm -hmm. couldn't get to the new growth because there were cities and freeways in their way. So exactly. So this is, this is a perfect example of um, management of a wild species working well. It absolutely is. And so the, it could, it can continue to work well. I think they're just Mm -hmm. kind of going, Hey, Oh, there's a little hiccup. Mm -hmm. We don't know. There's a lot of factors involved, but we're going to do what we can. Yeah, but they've done great so far. And, and even though you scoffed at me at the retelling of this, I watched a a flock, a herd, a gaggle, a gangle, a murder of turkeys. <laughs> uh, wait for a, a green light. A buffet, I think it's called. A buffet of turkeys. <laughs> wait for, wait for the light to change green, and then went across the crosswalk at a busy intersection in town, right next to the DMV. And so, like, I always thought this was the dumbest animal in the world, but they they seem to be surviving in an urban setting quite well. Strengths in the chat room asked me if cats can kill turkeys, and I don't think so. I think they're too big. The babies, maybe, but uh, full-size turkeys seem to have no fear of cats. There was actually uh, one turkey that was also living not far from here in the parking lot where I work, where also is housed some sort of animal out, outreach groups, feral cat feeding station where there's like a half dozen feral cats that these ladies come in and keep fed and have a little shelter for them. And Turkey hung out there around a half dozen cats with no fear. And also noticed at one point uh, had taken down a snake for its, its dinner. Nice. So, these turkeys are, I don't think cats are messing with turkeys, at least not the full grown ones. They, Go turkeys. Yeah. All right. Well, let us finish this show uh, on the, on the game the big game. Uh, Tip, do you want to go on with your story, Blair? Sure, absolutely. So um, in light of, yes, hunting and the difference between hunting and poaching, as we all know, is that hunting is legal and poaching is illegal. So poaching is the hunting and trafficking of animal products of endangered or protected species. And in the effort to save endangered species, reducing 
poaching is a huge part of that story. For some animals, it's the main stressor on their species like rhinos. And it, we can do our very best to catch people here in the United States who own things. But really, to fix the problem, you have to take a step back. You have to prevent people from selling them. Before that, you have to prevent people from entering the country with these smuggled products. And before mm. that, you have to prevent people from leaving their country with these smuggled products. The problem is that customs officials and U.S. Fish and Wildlife officials that are looking for these items have to do it by sight. And you can look at something and go, that really looks like a felid bone. I don't know if it's a tiger or a lion or a jaguar. I'm not sure. I'm going to hold this. I'm going to send it back to the lab. I'll let you know. Um, but other things can go right by, and it's very difficult to tell the difference between a pl piece of plastic that is tortoise shell colored and an actual tortoise shell item. So how do you tell the difference? With the DNA, of course. So a recent um, presentation at... Uh, at a, at a CITES conference, so that's the Convention on the International Trade of Endangered Species. Um, they, it was actually done by International Barcode of Life, which is a uh, DNA processing um, organization. They actually created something called Lab in a Box, which is a portable DNA barcoding kit. This, in theory, would make rapid species identification possible for port of entry and port of exit within just a few hours. So they could detain a person who is exiting or entering a country, look at their items right there in the airport, figure out what it is. And so this could really change the game for uh, reducing trafficking. Um, so this also works in conjunction with eyeball um, working on their DNA database, because this is all based, of course, on being able to match the DNA to DNA that they have. So they are developing this database. And then from there, they'll be able to use this portable DNA system, uh, scanning system, so that people in ports and airports will be able to see this when nice. it happens. Yeah. That's great. Absolutely. Real time analysis. Yeah. So what has science done for lions lately? <laughs> there we are. Maybe it'll help catch the poachers and the bones before they cross the borders. Absolutely. Um, yeah. More cool science. Um, what was I going to tell you about? Oh, remember that story a while back where I uh, talked about the whistling and the choruses up in our atmosphere, our upper atmosphere. Yeah. Yeah. So there are waves of high energy particles. There are waves in our Van Allen belts that that sing, that give whistling tunes and chorus waves. There are whistler waves and chorus waves and these different kinds of waves. And researchers have been like, what do these waves do? <laughs> What exactly? Well, they're making this noise. There's these waves, high frequency. You can you can hear these waves of energy in the Van Allen belts, our outer atmosphere. What is going on? And so uh, researchers just took some data from NASA's Van Allen probes mission and the Firebird 2 CubeSat. Now, I like this study a lot because it's a CubeSat, a little tiny satellite, CubeSat, little tiny satellite up in space, not a big honking satellite. This is a, a little deal. Together, they showed that a common plasma wave called a chorus wave in space is likely responsible for the impulsive loss of high energy electrons into Earth's atmosphere. And known as Whistler Mode Chorus, the waves are created by fluctuating electric and magnetic fields and they have rising tones, and it sounds kind of like chirping birds. And these rising waves possibly are the source of accelerating electrons that then shower down toward our upper atmosphere and cause the auroras that we see. Now, uh, there's researcher Aaron Brenneman, who's at the University of Minnesota in M Minneapolis, said, observing the detailed chain of events between chorus waves and electrons requires a conjunction between two or more satellites. 
There are certain things you can't learn by having only one satellite. You need simultaneous observations at different locations. And that's exactly what the Van Allen probes plus the Firebird 2 CubeSat allowed them to do. The Firebird 2 cruises at a height of 310 miles above the Earth. And uh, together with the Van Allen probes, the Van Allen probes initially observed chorus waves from their van, uh, from where they were. And then the Firebird 2 CubeSat saw the microbursts of these high energy electrons. And so together, taken together, the data confirm that these waves play an important role in controlling the loss of energetic electrons from those Van Allen belts that encircle our planet in radiative energy. And then, so it's so neat. And then moving on the other sound front, uh, researchers are trying to figure out a little bit more about how we can uh, engineer our environment to be better for bats. And they've determined that there are certain surfaces that echolocating bats might mistake for other things and might lead to more and more collisions. So the researchers showed that echolocating bats perceive smooth vertical surfaces as open areas. Uh Oh, <sighs> yeah. So hi, high, high rise buildings with large glass windows. <laughs> Spat. Yikes. <laughs> yeah. And so this, uh, I mean, we don't have tons of bats in our cities, but there are bat populations that live within cities and this could be having negative impacts on their survival. Uh, the researchers uh, found that these vertical surfaces, they mistake the smooth vertical surfaces as clear flight paths. And uh, this is likely as a result of their acoustic mirror properties. So it's, everything comes back sounding exactly the same. The smooth surface doesn't change the acoustic signal that the bats are sending out at all. So maybe we can put some bumps. Yeah, make everything bumpy. Put some bumps on our windows. <laughs> I don't know, just an idea. Might help with bird survival as well, because if you make it easier to see visibly, also maybe fewer birds will run into windows too. That's what I was thinking about. We put those stickers on windows to save the birds. So now we need to put up some bumps to save the bats. Bumps for bats, stickers for birds. Bumps for bats. Bumps for bats. (laughs) yeah all right everybody so this does bring us to the end of our twist giving episode of this week in science thank you so much for listening thank you for watching if you're watching thank you on this thanksgiving eve that we are producing this show really appreciate the fact that you are here with us listening wherever you are and we hope that you are having a wonderful day or night to yourselves and we're grateful for you being here very truly i am grateful and i'm grateful to my co-hosts for for making a great show every week Aww. thanks you guys don't know where i would be without you guys yeah probably in bed by now <laughs> it's true it's <laughs> very true i'm so i go to bed so early unless i'm binging on something on the on netflix but that said, thank you, especially among our chat room. Chat room, you're here every week. So good to see you and the comments that you make. Thank you. Identity for Fada and Brandon, thank you for helping us out week after week after week. We appreciate everything that you do for us. And I would like to thank our Patreon sponsors. Thank you to A Honey Moss, Aaron Luthan, Adam Mishkan, Alec Doty, Alex Wilson, Andy Gro, Arlene Moss, Artyom, Ben Rothig, Bill Kersey, Bob Calder, Braxton Howard, Brendan Minish, Brian Hedrick, Brian Condren, Brian Hone, Bruce Cordell, Byron Lee, Charlene Henry, Christopher Dreyer, Christopher Rapp, and Columbo Ahmed, Craig Porter, Dale Bryant, Dana Pearson, Daniel Garcia, Darwin Hannon, Daryl, Dave Neighbor, Dave Wilkinson, David, David Friedel, David Simmerly, David Wiley, Donald Trump, The Dubious, Dougal Campbell, E.O., Edward Dyer, Emma Grenier, Eric Knapp, Eric Wolf, Felix Alvarez, Flying Out, Gary S., Gerald Sorrell, G. Burton, Lattimore, Gerald Arniago, Greg Guthman, Greg Riley, Haroon Sarang, Hexator, Howard Lana, Luma Lama, Jacqueline Boyster, Jake Jones, James, James Dobson, James Randall, Jason Dozier, Jason Olds, Jason Roberts, Jason Schneiderman, Jean Tellier, 
Jim Drapo, Joe Wheeler, John Atwood, John Crocker, John Gridley, John Ratnaswamy, Keith Corsell, Ken Hayes, Kevin Parachan, Kevin Railsback, Senia Volkova, Kurt Larson, Larry Garcia, Layla Louis Smith, Mark Masaros, Marjorie Mark, Marshall Clark, Matt Sutter, Matthew Litwin, Mitch Neves, Moore, Cowbell, Mountain Sloth, Nathan Greco, Orly Radio. Patrick Cohn, Paul Stanton, Paul Disney, Phil Nadeau, Philip Shane, Randy Mazuka, Richard Hendricks, Richard Onimus, pa- Richard Porter, Rick Ramis, Robert Aston, Rodney, Rudy Garcia, Salvage, Salgad Sam, Shuwada, Sir Frickadelic, Stefan Insom, Steve DeBell, Steve Lessman, Steve Mashinsky, The Harden Family, Todd Northcutt, Tony Steele, Tyler Harrison, Tyrone Fong, Trainer 84, and Ulysses Adkins. Thank you. Thank you to all our Patreon sponsors. And if you are interested in supporting us on Patreon, you can find information on our website, twist.org, or you can go directly to patreon.com slash this week in science. Also, next week, we'll be doing this show once again, back again for more sciencey goodness, broadcasting live online at 8 p.m. Pacific time on twist.org slash live. You can watch and join our chat room. Don't worry if you can't make it. Oh, hey, you can find past episodes at twist.org slash YouTube. You can also find past episodes on Facebook This Week in Science, our Facebook account. You can also find past audio episodes on twist.org and you can find information about our 2018 Blair's Animal Corner catalog and our Zazzle store if you're interested in more, you know, holiday shopping. There's that, there's that out there. If, if yeah. you're interested in looking well, into it, if you want yeah. to get gifts for people, yeah, yeah. you know. And you know, I mean, if you want some place to send people to let them know about twists, twist.org is a good place to start as well. So you can share twist.org with people you love. Thank you, minions, for enjoying the show. Twist is also available as a podcast. Just Google This Week in Science. It's in your iTunes directory, or if you have a mobile type device, you can look for Twist the number four droid in the Android marketplace or simply this week in science and anything Apple marketplace For more information on anything you've heard here today, show notes will be available on our website. That's at www.twist.org where you can also make comments and start conversations with the hosts and other listeners. Or you can contact us directly. Email Kirsten at Kirsten at thisweekinscience.com, Justin at twistminion at gmail.com, or Blair at BlairBaz at twist.org. Just be sure to put twist, T-W-I-S, somewhere in the subject line, or your email will be spam filtered into oblivion. You can also hit us up on the Twitter, where we are at Twist Science, at Dr. Kiki, at Jackson Fly, and at Blair's Menagerie. We love your feedback. If there's a topic you would like us to cover or address, a suggestion for an interview, a haiku about bacteriophage transcriptosis, please let us know. We'll be back here next week, and we hope you'll join us again for more great science news. And if you've learned anything from the show, remember, it's all in your head. This week in science. This week in science. This week in science. This week in science, it's the end of the world. So I'm setting up shop, got my banner unfurled. It says the scientist is in, I'm gonna sell my advice. Show them how to stop the robots with a simple device. I'll reverse global warming with a wave of my hand. And all it'll cost you is a couple of grand. Science is coming your way So everybody listen To what I say I use the scientific method For all that it's worth And I'll broadcast my opinion All over the earth Cause it's this week in science This week in science This week in science Science Science. 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 This week in science This week in science this week in science, 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 I've got one disclaimer and it shouldn't be news That what I say may not represent your views But I've done the calculations and I've got a plan If you listen to the science you may just yet understand That we're not trying to threaten your philosophy We're just trying to save the world from jeopardy, jeopardy, jeopardy. And this week in science is coming your way So everybody listen to everything we say And if you use our method instead of rolling a die We may rid the world of toxoplasma Gandhi-i Cause it's this 
week in science. This week in science. This week in science. 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 This week in science. This week in science. This week in science. 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 Got a laundry list of items I want to address From stopping global hunger to dredging Loch Ness I'm trying to promote more rational thought And I'll try to answer any question you've got So how can I ever see the changes I seek When I can only set up shop one hour a week This week in science is coming your way You better just listen to what we say And if you've learned anything from the words that we've said Then please just remember it's all in your head Cause it's this week in science This week in science This week in science Science, 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 science. This week in science This week in science This week in science Science, 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 science This week in science This week in Science. This week in science, 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 this week in science.